Okay, so this is the uh, second lecture in, uh, on panel data models. Um, in the previous lecture, what we did is um, we looked at uh, basic panel uh, model estimation. We looked at uh, um, the, the, the basic structure of, of panel data. We looked how it looks like. We have both dimensions here, time series and cross-sectional. Uh, so we measure the same uh, collection of objects over a period of time. So we, that's why we have the sub, uh, the, um, the superscript here, the uh, the subscript here, I and 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 T. So I uh, uh, for individuals or uh, units, T for time, and we explain why it is important to um, uh, use model data uh, uh, or model panel data uh, when we are able to model heterogeneity explicitly by allowing for subject to specific variables it's more informative we know uh, we collect information about subjects over time so it's that's why it's more in, uh, informative uh, also uh, more degrees of freedom so you get uh, more more data points also we can change uh, we can study the change of uh, or the dynamics of change and etc we also talked about how it can, in some cases, remove some uh, 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 forms of uh, uh, omitted variable uh, price. So this is all from last week. We also, uh, uh, last week, we discussed the how to estimate a panel data uh, model. Um, so if you look at the, the first estimator here, the uh, pooled regression, so we ignore the fact that we have both dimensions. We just assume that the uh, the we just ignore we having i and t and then we we use OLS. With the fixed effect model, we included we uh, added the uh, mu mu i the country or unit specific effect, and in effect we could uh, estimate this model by using uh, dummy variables. In which case the uh, estimator will be least square dummy variable, and all what we have here is a number of dummies that uh, uh, for each, so we have dummies for uh, all uh, unit uh, uh, or all cross-section units. Uh, so if we have n units, we have n dummies. Uh, if we don't have uh, a constant, but if we uh, were to include a constant, then we should have n minus one dummies, okay? So we should drop one, not to fall on what we uh, call the dummy variable trap, okay? So not to have perfect multicollinearity. So if you have the number of dummies, equal the number of groups plus a constant that will cause perfect multicollinearity and in uh, with uh, most softwares probably you will have a warning message or an error message uh, to tell you that there is a problem there is perfect multicollinearity in your in your estimation but in the model we see now in the in this slide we don't have uh, 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 we don't have uh, I dropped the constants that's why I added in uh, dummies so, um, but this is not easy to estimate, especially if you have a large number of n. So, how many how many parameters would need to estimate here? Do you remember? So, how many parameters? You just need to count these parameters. Yeah. So, these are the parameters we need to estimate plus beta. So, if we have uh, x here, this equal k k x or k regressors. So that means we'll have k parameters plus n. Okay, n is the number of cross-section uh, units. So you see, if we have large n, that will be more like we lose uh, degrees of freedom. So one way to, to deal with this problem is to transform the model into the, and we discussed this, the within transformation and the way we, we, we do it, uh, we, um, this is the form of the, so we get the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the average for each uh, uh, cross-section and then, um, and then we, we, we estimate this model rather than the model with the uh, with the uh, all these dummies. Okay, so we could have within transformation, or we could have the between uh, uh, estimator. So between estimator, when we run a uh, cross-sectional regression on the time average value of the variables. So you average cross time for time not so cross t not i. So in this one we get take the average for i but they for each one or each cross section on it but this one we have uh, we, we 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 take the time average values of the variables well another way to deal with this 
which we explained as well last week, is to take the first difference. But the problem with these methods is that you most likely you will drop the um, any variables that don't change over time will will uh, will cancel out. Meaning, if you have a variable that defined, because the idea here is that when you when you for for example when you take the first difference, if this is our model, uh, this fixed effect model, and I take the first difference, meaning th is this minus t minus 1, so y i t minus y i t minus 1, this will drop, okay? Because m i is constant, so m i minus m i, so it just, it, it cancel out. So if you have variables that define variables that are time invariant or t variables that don't change over time, so they will drop because of this uh, sort of transformation. Um, we could also have a time fixed effect. Again, it's very similar to the uh, uh, fixed effect model, but in the sense that we have, we could include dummy to, uh, to, to estimate the model, but rather than having the dummies to define the units, we have dummies to define the time. So what we have here, we have, uh, if, if we believe really that the average value of y uh, it change over time, not cross-sectionally, so it depends on time, so we could we could estimate a time fixed effect model. And as I said, this, this dummy variable here capture the uh, time variation rather than cross-sectional variation. And again, how many dummies will have? The number of dummies will be T. So it depends how many, how many, uh, 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 the how long is, is T. So it depends. So if you have uh, annual data for 30 years, so that means you could have 30, 30 dummies and plus so 30 dummies means you would have 30 parameters to estimate plus the depends how many how many regressors you sorry so it's, it's going to be n plus n plus t you will drop one or you have the option not to include a constant because you see the specification is without a constant so when when you drop when you not have a constant, then that could be, uh, uh, the you, you could, I obviously it, it would be easier to interpret if you drop one. So because when you drop one, basically you're comparing, this is your your reference group where which you can compare with. So uh, it's it's much easier when you, when you come to interpretation, yes. Uh, so in that case, even if you drop one dummy, you, st you would have a constant and that will add one more parameters to estimate. So it's going to be t again. It's not t minus 1. Because if you drop one d, one, one dummy, then you would have you would have the constant back into the specification in this in this model, in this equation, and that will add one more parameter to estimate. So that means we in this specification, similar to the one we had we looked at in the uh, previous slide, we'll have t plus k uh, parameters to estimate. So this problem it doesn't exist with random effects model because with random effect model, this is we have this composite error term where uh, omega i t here uh, is uh, two parts or two components. E i here or epsilon i here, this is the uh, 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 unit is specific and it, it's it's random. So basically, it measures the random deviation of each entity's intercept from a global intercept which is called alpha here in this in this equation. So how far we go from from the common or the global uh, intercept alpha. Okay. So again, we don't have dummies here, and as I said, this is this is a problem we don't have with random effect model. So we don't drop the uh, variables that doesn't change over time and also we don't have a large number of dummies to capture heterogeneity or the variation in the cross-section dimension because this actually happened through the random component or this component uh, the the uh, the new uh, component in their term e, uh, epsilon uh, epsilon i uh, we also explained that well, there are some assumptions about this. We assume that this component is has zero mean independent of the other part or the other uh, component in their term. So this one shouldn't be correlated with this one. Uh, it has constant variance and should be independent from uh, any from explanatory variables. So it shouldn't be correlated with any of these x's. Okay. Uh, we also explained that all this estimation is consistent but not efficient, and that's why we use GLS. Uh, estimation instead of OLS estimation. So when we compare these two models, 
these two estimators, the uh, random effect with a fixed effect model. We see that random effect. We explained that ram random effect uh, model produces more efficient estimation than the fixed effect. And also it will not remove, as I said, the explanatory variable that don't uh, uh, change over time. And we would have fewer parameters to be estimated. That saves degrees of freedom. So all this, we discussed this last, last week, and we, we understand why. So, but the problem here is that the random effect model is valid only when this omega is uncorrelated with the explanatory variables. And we saw how we can test this using uh, a Hausmann test. And if this assumption isn't valid, if this assumption doesn't hold, then fixed effect will be more preferred then. Okay? So this is, this is we covered all of this last, uh, last week. Okay, so today we'll we'll carry on. We'll uh, we'll look at uh, uh, more uh, extensions of the the uh, panel data models, or recent development in in panel data models. Uh, so what we've done so far, we basically, or in in general, econometrics e of uh, panel data mainly was developed for large number of cross section units and small t. And that's the case in economics because uh, I probably mentioned this a few times before. I said in economics we're not that lucky because even if you have uh, quarterly data, so you don't have really T is T in most cases is not really long enough. Okay. So what we'd have here we'd have econometric methods that are developed for panel data. They actually were developed for a large n and small uh, small T. And this uh, field was actually known as microeconometrics. That's because basically it is based on survey data where you have T very small and you have N large. Again, N is the number of objects. So do you remember these objects could be individuals, could be countries, could be firms, could be anything, yeah? So these or could be firms, so these are number of objects N or the cross-section units. T is the time. And as I said, in microeconometrics, okay, uh, that's that's what you're using in your in your in your thesis. Uh, basically, you're relying on survey data. So how many how many rounds you have? So t equal two. How many cross section you have? Twenty thousand objects. Okay, 20,000 individuals or households. So that's the case, yeah? So most of these, that the traditional method or the traditional panel data actually was developed for that reason. If you remember, in, in last lecture, last week, we were mainly concerned about how to capture heterogeneity. Because these individuals, these, these 20,000, even it doesn't matter how many variables you will include on the right-hand side, how many Xs or how many regressors you will include to control for, for different effects, you still cannot capture entirely the heterogeneity because people still are different from each other. Okay? So that, that was our main concern last uh, last week, we were thinking more about heterogeneity. How would we do that? If we include mu i, fixed effect, or if we include uh, uh, the, the random effect, the composite error term, and how that works. So we were mainly thinking of heterogeneity, okay? Because that was developed for this sort of data, when we have very short t. Basically, or in other words, I would say the problems that come with data or with time series weren't very, we were not very concerned when we discussed this last week. We didn't think much about things like issues like uh, stationarity, contiguration, all issues that come with with time series because t is very short, t is very small. So that is the idea here. But today we're going to think of the other way. What if we have a long t? So this is one of the uh, uh, developments, uh, uh, basically, in, in macro panel data modeling, where now we have some long t so we have some models where we have t is long okay and that would be different because this will uh, actually uh, pose different challenges that you need to uh, take into consideration so in this lecture as i as i said we basically will be focusing on panel data so we still have panel data we still have both dimensions n and t but in this case we have large t as well 
Okay, so when you think of fixed effect model, random effect model, you basically didn't worry. We didn't worry much about uh, 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 issues related to time series econometrics. We were more concerned about the heterogeneity. How would we capture this heterogeneity across different units? Okay, but today we'll be more concerned about time series. Okay, about t. So our main concern today would be mainly about t, but also because in most, in some cases, you will have. Uh, uh, large T and large N as well. So this is very important, but just basically that's why it's called panel, panel time series, so because we have large large T. And it, this is something we we touched up on last week when we uh, make made this uh, b b uh, when we discussed the difference between large uh, panel and and and, and, and short, short panel and long panel. Long panel when we have T is relatively uh, longer than uh, than uh, than n or greater uh, bigger than n. In most cases, wherever uh, the data set you have, so basically whenever you deal with uh, panel data, uh, an appropriate estimator. So which estimator to use depends on the relative size of n and t. Okay, whether t is bigger than n or n is bigger than t. And that's what this will guide you which estimator will be more suitable in this case, in, 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 every ca in each case, okay? So because I always like get this question from people, which, which really estimator, which sort of model I should follow, again, look at your data and that's, that's what, uh, 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 what determine which, which estimator will be more appropriate in this, in this case. But the question now, I say large T, so how, how large is large? So when I say large t, how large is large? How how large to be considered large? Like yeah, but how large? Like Ten years, hundred years, two hundred years, millions of years? Uh, it depends. So you really, we we want we want to ask that question. So if we're starting by looking at time series, panel time series, and we define these as the panel with large T, then we need to think of what large, even when we talk about large N, you still think, you still want to think how large is large? How can I define large, uh, large T? So the idea here, um, it's not a rule, it's something like to guide you when you uh, think about the, uh, uh, the structure of your, of your panel uh, in terms of T and N, and an N is T should be large enough to estimate different time series model for each unit. So if I have um, panel data for a number of countries, and if T for each country in my model is long enough to estimate a time series model, okay, a meaningful model, then that could be uh, then you should be concerned about the time series issues in your panel. Okay, so. Uh, as I say, so the sample size t which is required for sensible estimation of the individual equation depends actually on the model because that is the idea. So mainly, or for example, if you want to, if you have a simple bivariate regression with uh, strictly exogenous variables, so you have one y on the left hand side and one x on the, on the right hand side and this x is, I is, is exogenous. So the, the causality is going for one way. So the idea here, if we have t, if this panel, if this is my panel, which I have both dimension n and t, so 10, 10 or 12 or 15 might be might be enough, might be large enough. But if you have lag dependent variables, so if you have more lags on the right hand side, then you need more data. So the more more uh, lags you have, the more complex the model you have, the more data you would need in t to you will need t to be bigger to consider or to be worried about the. Uh, how large is large or how, how, how large is t. So again, uh, I think the same would apply to, to n, uh, but as I said, the important thing here is the, uh, the, the relative size of n and t, okay? So that is the, uh, the important thing. Some people, uh, actually this is taken from another presentation, so this is not my slide, but the idea here is that how to probably differentiate between macro panels where you actually perfectly, this is what we call time series panels and micro panels. So if you look at the sort of estimation you would have in micro panels, it would be morely, uh, mainly fixed effect because this is something, or random effect, this sort of uh, estimators that we, we discussed last, uh, last week because we mainly are concerned about the uh, heterogeneity among uh, cross section. But with the, uh, with, the, with the macro panels, when we have T large, okay, 
that means we would be more concerned about the time series issues, okay? But also, when you have large panel in any case, when you have N large and T large, then you would be worried about both. So in the issues that are related to, to both, it's something that you should, you should consider in your, uh, in your estimation. So this is just a, a, a very uh, quick comparison about, again, so you see here with the macro panel, we're concerned more about stationarity, unit root, all this uh, uh, configuration, all these issues that we actually covered in time series, okay? So let's just summarize this. So if I have a, a large panel data, Okay, so what should I <coughs> be concerned about? What should I be worried about? We're not going to cover all of these today, but these are issues that you need to, uh, to, to, to worry about, you need to, to be aware of. First of all, the heterogeneity across units. Well, it's still there, it, it, because we, if we have number of cross-sections, yeah? We have number of individuals. We have number of firms. We, need, we still need to be worried about the how these are different from each other. Okay, so or this heterogeneity, we need to consider it in the model. So that's one thing. So heterogeneity across units, dynamics, including the treatment of unit roots, and this is what we're gonna be uh, focusing on today, the unit root and the uh, configuration. And also we need to think of the cross-section dependence. Okay, so let's just look quickly at each one of those before we jump to the, uh, the main... Uh, um uh, estimation or the main example we'll have in this lecture. So basically, as we said, heterogeneous panel models allow for the parameters to do differ over units. So if you see beta x, so you'll see these models with beta i x, meaning that the slope parameter will be different. Or you could have, uh, again, heterogeneity is just, uh, you could assume that the parameters, what we, what we did in the fixed effect model so far in last week, we we never seen beta i. We always see beta because we assume that beta is, this is like homogeneous. So this is across all panels is the same slope, is the same effect. Okay? But with heterogeneous panel data, actually you can't test for this equality. So you don't have to take it as granted. You can't test for it. But this would be, uh, 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 you could do that if you have enough or your data is large enough or your panel is large. Uh, large enough. So basically with heterogeneous uh, uh, panel models, as I say, it allows the parameters to differ over units. So if you have, if you study countries, you allow the, the impact to be different or the effect to be different from one country to, to another, the effect of X on Y, okay? So again, and this is something you can test for. So if, if, if they are homogeneous, if the effect is, if there is no uh, significant differences between these, so that, that you actually can assume then homogeneity. So the homogeneity hypothesis then can be tested for in this sort of, 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 of models, but uh, empirical evidence show that homogeneity hypothesis is often rejected, okay? And, and the size of this, heterogeneity sometimes is, is large, or the differences is, is large. And this is one of the uh, papers that show us that uh, treatment of heterogeneity is very important if you want to understand the growth uh, process. So the bottom line here is that when you have large panels, then you start thinking of how would you model heterogeneity? How would you model, uh, 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 how would you, um, test for the equality of the parameters across different, uh, different units. So heterogeneity is one important issue. We're not gonna cover it in detail today, but again, as I said, we'll cover the dynamics more. We'll look at panel uh, uh, unit root test and the panel uh, co-integration tests. So looking at the uh, dynamics, as I said, when you have T is large enough, then you, you should be concerned about the issues that would uh, would face us with um, with time series. So when you have T large enough, would allow us to estimate least restrictive dynamic model where we have uh, different uh, uh, perhaps different lags on the on on the right hand side. So we can add more uh, 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 like lags on on the right hand side. We can have a dynamic model where we have lags of the dependent variable and the probably in the, the, the independent variable as well on the right hand side. Um, we understand from before that most economic time series already it's I, I1, but if we have a combination of these two I, I1 that produce an error which is 
I0, then we would say that these two series are co-integrated. It is more challenging with panel data, but still we have the same concept. So when you have um, I1 series, which is something expected with micro, uh, with economic or financial series, that you would have uh, 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 I1 series, then if these two produce the, uh, if the error is, is, uh, is, is I0, then both would say they are integrated. The same applies with panel data as well. And we'll see how today, because this, this is the main uh, uh, point or the main topic in this lecture. Okay, so we already covered this one, but um, again, as I said, the in this in this case, unit root integration, all the problems that uh, face us with the um, with the with time series will be concerned about as well. So uh, this is just an example. Sometimes, uh, if you look at the very um, like standard uh, Cobb Douglas production function. Uh, some people argue that stationarity or spurious regression isn't um, a big deal in this, uh, in this sort of uh, uh, large panel data. And for example, if we consider this Cobb Douglas uh, production function for number of countries from I to N, and in this function, as you, you know, output de uh, determined by is determined by the L and K, these are the inputs, and A here is the total factor uh, 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 productivity. So how would we estimate this? We explained this in lecture two. Then you if you take, if you, uh, um, take the log of both uh, sides, then you would change this to uh, a linear and parameter model. Okay, so this is this is the logarithmic uh, function, but if you look at the parameters here, beta i and alpha i and a i, they all are, are, are linear. So it is quite possible that this, uh, uh, there's no linear combination of, of log output, labor and capital that would produce this equal to, or this uh, 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 A would be I0. But again, it's, it's, it's something that you can debate about. Uh, but the most important, or the, the, the next point, or the next issue you need to think of, so first you need to think of heterogeneity. Dynamics. This is something we'll we'll deal with today with the with with an example. So we're gonna use we're gonna follow an example follow an example today about how we would test for unit root test panel unit root test and uh, panel integration. But another issue as well that we need to consider with with panel data with large panels is the cross dependence. The cross section dependence is is a, is a, is an important issue, especially if you have in is large as well if you have large n so if you have a large number of cross section just remember we're talking about large panels so we we assume that we have t is long okay but now if we have n is long as well so if you we have n is big as well then we have to worry about cross section uh, uh, dependence uh, uh, so if the cross section dependence is large and you didn't account for, this is not going to improve the, the efficiency of your, your estimator. So it would be you it probably would be better off if you uh, just estimate individual time series models rather than having a panel data because it's not going to add much efficiency to your, uh, your estimation. So where this cross-section dependence come from? So if you think about this, if we're talking about house, house prices in different regions, so that we could have some spatial uh, spillovers. Okay, so there's an impact from unit, different units, or the prices of houses in different in different regions. So units here are the the uh, uh, these uh, different regions, so they affect each uh, each other. Or we can have links. <laughs> Sorry. So countries could be. They might not be neighbors. Okay, country and country B, geographically I'm talking. So they're not. They, they don't have to be neighbors, but they could be linked through trade or financial linkages. So that would determine how the spillover works, yeah, from country A to country B, okay? So it doesn't have to be a spatial spillover. It could be, again, through other uh, effects such as trade or, so if you're trying to model, uh, uh, or if you have a model with uh, cross-sections uh, that include number of countries, that these tell countries, they still can be affected by each other through trade linkages or, or, or financial linkages. So they didn't have to be, and this is something, they didn't have to be neighbors. They didn't have to be, they didn't have to have this spatial spillover. So they could, they could 
uh, 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 be linked in different ways. And this is something you need to consider as well if you have uh, a large panel. Or a common, uh, common unobserved factors, like if there's like a something like the global financial crisis, something that hit all countries at the same time, or if there's like an oil, uh, uh, oil price shocks that would affect all economies in at the same time. So these are like common global factors that would affect all, all cross sections at the same time. So this is something we need to model. We need to keep, we need to, uh, 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 to, to, to account for when we model. Uh, um uh, large panels. So um, again, this is this is like could be an advantage if you have a large panel. So cross-section dependence may allow you to estimate un unobserved common factors, as I said, that such as global cycles or global shocks, that we wouldn't be able to do this with with time series. So we've got three issues. Okay, before just I f explain what we're gonna focus on more detail today. So three issues with large panels. What are they? Heterogeneity, yeah, so you have to worry about. You have to worry about dynamics, anything related to what we discuss about unit, uh, sorry, about time series econometrics. But since we have large T, then we need to worry about. Today we'll focus about these two issues: the unit root, panel unit root, and panel configuration. Okay, so any other issue like that is related to time series still need to think of, like structure breaks, indigeneity, anything that would. Uh, bother you or would be important for you to test for in, in, in a time series model or in a model that is based on time series data, then you should, you should worry about if you have t, t, uh, large t. Okay? Then the cross-section dependence again. So these are three issues that you need to be aware of. So as I said, all the standard issues, time series issues, again, it applies to large panels, but what we will focus on today will be on unit root and configuration. Uh, but before I start with an example, it's, it's just uh, uh, very important to summarize what we would expect from panel data estimators in general. Okay, so basically when you expect to gain or to improve efficiency of your estimation because you're actually combining data about cross-section and um, and time element as well, the time dimension. So you would expect that the, uh, the, uh, there will be some kind of improvement in efficiency, okay? But this is a question, this is a question. This is not really uh, uh, something that you can take it for granted. So again, this is something you need to, to think of. So, but it also allows us to answer questions that cannot be answered with only time series or only cross sections. And we can be more flexible with panel data estimators because we can define parameters, uh, parameter heterogeneity either over time or over unit. So let's, let's just now focus on what we we're going to discuss mainly today is just an example of this paper. And I think you've seen this paper before. And I expect that you've read that this paper. And if you haven't, then you need to do that. Okay? So there are four papers or five papers on Blackboard you need to re read those five papers carefully uh, and to be aware of the econometric technique that is used in these uh, econometric techniques that are used in these papers and any limitations of these techniques. Okay, so you always think of uh, what, what else should this researcher have considered when they do, when they try to address this research question. So you've got four, five papers, when you read them, Ask yourself about what is the research question, okay? So what economic theory tell us about this question or this relationship between these variables? And then what is the econometric technique is uh, used? And what type of data they use? Is it time series? Is it panel data? Is it, okay? And then what are the limitations? Are they wh were they able to answer the question or not? Are they convincing? Uh, is the story convincing to you? Okay, so you need to think more like critically about these papers, not just reading the papers. But at first, at first step, you need to be aware or just to read or familiar with with the paper. So this is one of the five papers on Blackboard, and as I say, this is my paper with uh, two other co-authors, uh, and it uh, it just came out uh, 2017 this year in the Quarter Review of Economics and Finance, and the title is Catching the Mirage: The Shadow Impact of Financial Crisis. I think I explained that before. Um, so basically, what we're trying to do here, you've seen this slide before. So they're saying the research question, this paper, 
how the shadow economy behaves in time of financial crisis. So we have two, two problems here. First of all, we need to estimate the shadow economy. And this is what we'll focus on today because that's the thought of techniques we use in, in this paper, okay? And also then we need to see, s once we get the uh, s uh, estimation of the shadow economy, the size of the shadow economy, then we'll try to see the impact of the financial, financial crisis on the size of the shadow economy. And we explain this that we could expect the uh, impact of the financial crisis on the shadow economy to go either way. So it could be that, um, in time of crisis, so it's really bad time for the whole economy, so you wouldn't be able to find job in formal uh, sector or in the formal sector, okay? So that means the shock hit both sectors, the official and the unofficial, or the recorded and the unrecorded, the shadow or the official economy at the same time. So basically, that means the size of the shadow economy will, will, will shrink in time of crisis, okay? Or we could expect that those who uh, get fired, they lose their jobs in the official economy, in the formal sector because of the financial crisis, they will go or they will be forced to move into the shadow. So they will find jobs in the informal sector. And in this case, the informal sector will play as like sort of buffering uh, role. So it absorbs the shock. It helps the economy to absorb the shock. So our question is, was, in time of financial crisis, if the size of the shadow increases, that means actually it absorbs the shock. So it is something that we should actually, uh, we shouldn't worry about in time of financial crisis. Okay? But if the, f if the, if the size of the uh, shadow economy shrank during the financial crisis, meaning that the income effect is greater than the substitution effect, then uh, we, we actually need to think of other, uh, other things. Like because if, the shock affect both sides, like if, if the shock hit both sectors at the same time and people cannot find jobs in the informal sector, then you wouldn't worry much about anti-shadow regulations or policies in time of financial crisis because actually it's not giving you any chance to absorb the shock. So I don't really care about the, actually I s I'll, I'll keep those in place because basically those there are, uh, 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 there's empirical evidence how this uh, the, the negative impact of shadow economy on, on, on development or on growth, okay, or in economic development in general. Anyway, so this is, this is the main issue in the paper. And as I said, it's very important whenever you in a paper, um, not just the five papers that you need to read for this module on, on Blackboard, any paper you just need to think of the research question, what they're trying to achieve, okay, what they are trying to, uh, what the, uh, uh, are the authors trying to, to address. So as I said, our main challenge here is the measurement issue. How would we measure the shadow economy? How would we measure something that is meant to remain in the shadow? Something that we shouldn't be able to see because there is no records of the shadow economy or any activities taking place in the shadow economy. So that was one of the challenges and that's what we're trying to do today. Okay? How to measure the shadow economy. Then we, we, we move to, once we get estimates of the shadow economy, then we'll be able to... Uh, uh, measure the uh, impact of financial crisis on the shadow economy. So the <coughs> main equation we used to estimate the shadow economy is um, the energy consumption. Basically, there are different measures or different methods of measuring the shadow economy or estimating the shadow economy because we never know uh, the, the real size of the shadow economy. So we, we have to estimate it. Okay, so we have to use some some uh, uh, some other variables to make some inference or to know about the, shady, the, the the size of the shady economy. So this is one of the methods. What we did here, we proposed to use the energy consumption. Most people you would uh, they would use the um, electricity consumption. So the change in electricity consumption as a proxy of the change in total economic activity. So when I talk about total economic activity, I'm talking about both sides the official and the unofficial, the shadow and the official, the recorded economy, okay? So if you get the growth rate in the total economic activity, and if you have, uh, 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 you have the official one is measured already, so the difference should give you the, the, the shadow, the size of the shadow, 
Okay, so most people would would have used that. So they use electricity consumption as a proxy for total economic activity, and then given that you have already estimates or you have uh, figures for the GDP for the official one, then if you subtract that from the total economic activity, then that will give you an estimation of the um, of the shadow economy, the size of the shadow economy. Uh, electricity mainly. Exactly, exactly. And that was one of the uh, critiques in this paper that we, we said, well, it doesn't have to. Well, m there are many papers that show that electricity consumption is a good, is a good proxy for total economic activity. But what we criticized here in this paper is that it doesn't have to be the case based on your point. And that's really a good point because the whole m method is, is based on the assumption that people in the shed are using electricity and it doesn't have to be the case. Okay, they could be using any uh, any other source of uh, energy. Wherever, yeah, exactly. So they might not be using. So it might not be the best one. But as I said, yes, there was the uh, uh, enough evidence of electricity. But what we did, we said, why not to challenge that? Why not challenge that? Because by the way, we did energy consumption as we proposed and the electricity consumption as well, just to show the differences okay but anyway so you know you know you don't have to worry about these differences now what we are we are uh, concerned about in this lecture is that how to estimate this equation and this will take us to the topic we want to focus on today panel uh, time series so remember when you have large t then you will be concerned about the issues uh, uh, associated with uh, time series econometrics, yeah, and is the case here we have we have we have a panel that has a relatively large T, okay. So basically, what we have here we have data from 1970, but I think I think 1971 because we got the the changes 1972. So what we added to this, we followed another paper that proposed the idea of if you estimate an equation of the energy or electricity consumption, then electricity consumption would increase with uh, uh, in, in like industrial value added or how much the country is developing. So because one as you develop, you, you consume more uh, electricity. So this is one, one factor. And also the price or the cost of energy or electricity. So this in this case, in this, in this paper, we focus on energy consumption. So basically now we have data for a number of countries. We, we had nine countries, okay? And we had data from 1970, okay? So as I said, so this is the annual percent change in energy consumption. The, the P is the real price. And IND here is the industrial value added uh, to GDP. So the main idea here is to filter the energy consumption data. So these are the factors that we would imagine or would expect to determine the level of energy consumption. And then anything remain in the residual, that should be because of the shadow, the growth of the shadow economy. So this is unexplained part in your model. Okay, so we take out any impact that we would know of, like all the, the important factors that determine the energy consumption, and then what is left, or the residuals from this equation, could be a proxy for unexplained total economic activity. So that part, okay? So it's kind of filtering out the data, or filtering out the series, uh, the energy consumption, okay? so. Our main challenge here is we want to estimate this equation. Why? Because we want the residual from this equation. So that is what is related to what we're covering today, is how would we estimate this equation if we have large T, relatively large T. So given that we have long time or relatively long time dimension, so we've got about 30, 40, not more than 30, about 40, um, 40 T, and how many N? nine so relatively t is much bigger than n okay in this in this model so what we we how would how did we go about this first when we first uh basically we need to test for stationarity or for unit root using panel unit root tests so and if these are uh, uh, serious or these different uh, variables are found to be uh non-stationary then we would go with uh, test the configuration, and if we if they are configured, then we can use one of the uh, 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 estimators that 
are suitable in this case of having panel or integrated panels. Okay, one of which is which we will cover today, which is which actually we used in this paper, which uh, uh, it's called it is called group mean uh, fully modified uh, fully modified yeah OLS ordinary least square. It's just a long name. Okay, so it's called MG uh, FMOLS. That's the abbreviation, just a long one. But anyway, don't worry about that now. Just think about the main strategy. So don't don't get uh, lost in details. So we've got this equation. We with uh, relatively t long t, and we want to use panel integration techniques to estimate this equation. So I have three things we need to do now. One, to test for panel uh, unit root. Uh, to use one uh, one of the panel unit root tests, okay. So basically, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to do a unit root test, but for panels, because this is panel data. This is not time series data, okay. One way to do this is to go with individual time series, and you look at each time series individual. And this is something we look at, but this is something we didn't do in the paper, okay. So I'll look at this very quickly in one slide. But there are other tests that are actually designed for panel. Uh, data to test unit root in panel data, and then different tests like look at the uh, configuration panel data, and finally we will estimate the, the the model. Okay, so the whole idea is just to get the proxy at the end or the residual. Okay, so we need to estimate this this equation. So basically, um, w there's one problem with pa with with the unit root test in general. Including, of course, the uh, 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 the the, the well-known test the augmented Dickey fuller ADF uh, test, which is the low power. So these tests are of low power, especially if you have a modest sample size, if you have a small sample, si sample size. Okay, and low power test means that you fail to reject the null hypothesis while it should be rejected. That's what it means, low power. Okay, so you could extend that with the, 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 the tests that are designed for panel data, extend that because you've got both dimensions together. You've got T and N, so you've got more data. So the main problem here is that we have, if we have a small sample size, uh, as the sample becomes smaller, the tests become even uh, of low, lower power. But with panel data, we could extend that by adding by having more uh, or bigger sample size. There are two things to consider in all the tests because we're going to cover about three, four tests today. So it's very important to think about the bigger picture, not get just lost in the details, okay? So one thing, you need to think of the design and interpretation of the null hypothesis, the null and the alternative hypothesis for these tests, what they are testing, okay? So also you need to think of what about, how about the cross-sectional dependence? This is something we, we, we talked about before earlier today. We say we need to be concerned about the cross-sectional dependence, especially if we have a uh, large end, but in general, in large panels, we should think of the um, cross-sectional dependence. Um, early tests or studies assume that cross-sectional independence are, um, they assume independence, that means there's no cross-section dependence, and this is what they call the first generation panel in true test. So this is the test that we didn't do, which called the multivariate ADF, which basically runs separate regression over time for each series. So that's one way to do it, yeah? But this doesn't use the full structure of the panel. So basically what you're doing here is just taking the same, the same way we did it before, you're just basically looking at each time series individually. But this technique are not really very is not really very popular because people would prefer to use the full panel structure rather than looking at the time series element only. Okay, so going back to our paper, these are the tests we try to do. So basically, why are we doing more than one test? So that could be a question that comes to your mind when you read in a paper who, uh, which applies unit root tests. You will see them probably trying at least few a few of them. If not, if they report only one, they would just say we've done the, uh, the others and we confirm the results, okay? So basically, it's just the idea of the low power test. These are low power tests, okay? So again, we explain what that means. Remember, so low power means that you fail to reject the null hypothesis while it should be rejected, okay? So they tend to fail to reject the null hypothesis when 
it should be rejected. So anyway, so these are the tests we covered, and this is the, these are the tests we we're going to explain now. Okay, so basically, um, again, we'll do this for each one of these variables. So we've got three variables: energy consumption, energy uh, price, and industrial uh, uh, value to GDP. Okay, value added to GDP. So the first test, which is the LLC test, IBS, BES, or Bistrand test, these three tests, they are very similar in terms of the null hypothesis, what they are testing. So basically, the null hypothesis is there is unit root. Okay? This one, the series are stationary. So the null hypothesis is different in this one. So how these differ? They differ in the alternative hypothesis. So that's why I said it's important with panel unit root tests to consider the design and the structure or the interpretation of the null and the alternate, because that is the difference between the all these tests. Okay, again, so the first three tests, they, they have similar null hypothesis. They look at the there's a, a unit root, okay? Or basically the data are, are non-stationary, are not stationary. The third one, it reverses the null hypothesis. So basically, it tests for stationarity. So the null hypothesis is that data or the variables are stationary. Okay. So this is this is one important difference between these uh, uh, four uh, uh, tests. So if you consider a simple data panel data model with AR1, so we've got only XIT. So if this is the series of interest or this is the variable of interest XIT. And we consider this uh, structure where this is the first lag, so it's R A R one. So uh, in the right hand side, you have only one lag of the uh, variable of x. So we want to test for this. So basically, what we're trying to do here is um, you could add any deterministic component that could be, which is defined by d here. So that could be a panel a specific means or time trend or both. So you can add a constant, or you can add you can add time trend, or you can add you can add uh, uh, both. So as I said, these three tests, LLC, IPS, PES, they uh, they examine that this row i equal to one for all against this one is less than than one. Okay. So basically, if this is true. So basically what we're testing for here that this is this has unit root. X here has a unit root, XIT. Okay? So if you if you accept that. So basically if you accept the null hypothesis, that means they have unit root. So the problem here is that they are different about what is the situation for the alternative hypothesis. Is it going to hold for at least one panel? Remember we have nine countries. Is it gonna be the case with only one country? or some panels, few countries, or all panels, or the, the entire panel, okay? So this is how, how they are different from each other, okay? So again, going back to the four tests, so the three, the first three, they use the test of unit root. The fourth one, Hadri test, look at the, or test for stationarity. So this is one main difference between all these tests. The other difference between the three tests here, so they've got the same null hypothesis, but they test for the alternative hypothesis, whether it applies or it holds for at least one panel or some panels or uh, all, all panels. So if we look at the first one, the LLC, the um, first of all, it has a very restrictive assumption, which implies the equality of rho i across all sections, all panels. So basically, it assumes that this doesn't exist, i. So it's actually the row for all. So it's the same coefficient for all panels. So this is more restrictive because there, there's nothing to guarantee this. It, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be the case. Okay. So basically, that's that's the more restrictive one. So it's a very restrictive assumption, and also it it it, it ig uh, augment this structure. By adding by adding some some lags of the dependent variable, and uh, the uh, on the right hand side to account for serial correlation, so basically this is what actually the structure the, the the equation for this test. So what is the difference here is now we have 
Remember, this is xit, so this is one lag, but actually it adds more lags to account for serial correlation. Okay, so this is just more lags of the uh, uh, of the series or of the dependent uh, variable. So, and finally, it assumes that the errors are independently uh, distributed across across panel. So this is one thing. So we're looking at the the first one. So what's the difference with the IPS? IPS start with the first assumption about row. So it actually it relaxes this assumption. It doesn't require, it doesn't have to be the same. So we don't have to be actually. If I want to be more accurate in this, and I don't know why I did it that way, I think that should this uh, uh, subscript should drop, should be just throw. Okay, but with the other test, okay, the IPS that means we can include that row. So we can include this this subscript I. So it could be different from. Uh, uh, one panel to, to another because it actually relaxes the assumption. Also, one advantage of this uh, uh, test, it actually doesn't require a balanced data set. Do you remember what is a balanced data set? We discussed this last week. Yeah, it's empty for all in, yeah? So, the yeah, so basically it's the same, yeah? So, the if uh, this, this is not a requirement with the IPS, so it's fine. If you have unbalanced panel data, so you still can use IPS. But with the other tests, you can't use IP, uh, you can't test for um, unit root uh, in, in panels that is not uh, balanced. Um, again, it's just about the assumptions and how it treats uh, the uh, row, which is mainly here. And also, it's actually designed for uh, uh, for panels, it allows for heterogeneous variances across across panels. So it's actually designed for heterogeneous uh, heterogeneous panels. So the null hypothesis again. Remember the first three. So it's the LLC IPS, the uh, uh, PSRN or BS one, the the old test for uh, uh, unit root. Okay. So this is the null hypothesis. The difference here is that this allows for heterogeneous panels. So it allows for heterogeneity among these, these panels. The alternative, see the alternative here? So basically this one, uh, uh, um, test for the alternative hypothesis the of um, stationary data or stationary variables for some of the panels. So it doesn't have to be all. So basically in our case, we have got nine countries. So if this is, if you reject the null hypothesis of uh, unit root, okay? So basically what you would assume is that you would have stationary data. But is it going to be the case with all the panels? No, with IPS doesn't mean that. So if you get only one or two out of the nine panels or out of the nine countries with data that are stationary, then you will reject the the, the null hypothesis of unit truth. And this is one of the problems with these sort of uh, um, uh, panel uh, unit truth tests. So there's nothing like really confirmed because basically you reject the null hypothesis saying that your data doesn't have unit truth or your data is a stationary, but be careful because it's stationary for some panels. So it doesn't mean that for all panels it's stationary. So you can even you can't even treat it as stationary for all balance. So this is one of the uh, uh, weaknesses or one of the issues with these uh, uh, sorts of tests, and also it suffers from size uh, uh, distortions uh, in the presence of in the presence of cross-sectional dependence. So now, if you compare this with the previous one, the IBS with LLS, so IBS allows for heterogeneous bundles. Okay, but it doesn't allow for cross-sectional dependence. The third one, the BAS or the PESRAN test 2007, allows for heterogeneous panels with cross-section dependence. Okay, so this is why we do different tests. We're just trying to see uh, under different assumptions how they work. So, um, oops. yeah, as I said, so then the the, fo um, the fourth test, as I said, these test the problem here is that if you even if you reject the test if you reject the null hypothesis you're not sure about what's the case actually with these uh, uh, variables are they stationary are they all stationary or some of them or only at least one of them and as i said if you have so that means they are not very powerful so what hardly suggests then is just to reverse the null hypothesis rather than testing for unit root you test for stationarity 
okay you test whether these variables are stationary uh, or not but again you'll see a problem here is that uh, the alternative hypothesis having at least one panel with unit truth but if you do both types of tests so it's like it gives you an indication whether your your um, your variables are stationary or non-stationary okay because they use different uh, different unit root or sorry different null, null hypothesis okay and this is what uh, what we did and actually it was, the, it was there was another advantage of using hardware test is that it is designed actually for data set with large t and small uh, small n which is the case or moderate n which is the case with this study we had like 40 or more than 40 years and n was 9 so uh, basically it sounds good for for our estimation so to introduce the test just very quickly i'm not going to spend much time in this to introduce the test if this is our series and r here is just a random walk process so basically what we are testing here is the uh, if the variance of this um this part here uh equal uh, zero then uh, then this will collapse to a constant and that means the data are stationary so the the null hypothesis we had retest data are stationary that's that's the bottom line here okay okay so this is the table from uh basically we did all these tests but what we presented in uh, in the paper is only one test okay but i think the, there was a footnote to explain that we've done the other tests too to confirm the the results we we have but what we have here under different assumptions of the test so these are the um the energy consumption energy price and industrial value added to gdp and in all cases whether you add uh, intercept or time trend remember that we could add deterministic components intercept or both intercept or, or time trend so we reject the null hypothesis in most cases meaning that the data are not stationary remember the null hypothesis here that these data are stationary because i'm doing this is this is hard to stationarity test so in this case we have some evidence that the data are uh, uh, or have unit root or are non no, are not stationary so that means we can proceed to test for contagration whether these data are contagrated or not do you remember why we're trying to do this we want to submit that equation to obtain the residuals which would give us an indication of the unexplained part of the economic activity which is should be due to the shadow economy so we're looking at the residual we want to get this residual but the problem if we got this this uh, panel data model we want to estimate first but because we have relatively large t then we need to use this sort of panel contagration technique so basically what we did first we test for unit root it seems that we have unit root okay because even with the other three tests we did the other three tests where the uh, the panel uh, sorry the null hypothesis where was you test for the uh, uh, presence of unit root then both as i said so in in both cases they are both are weak they are not very uh, powerful tests okay and that's why we we we, we had to do different tests for for banal unit truth the ips no the uh, im uh, pisran and 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 chen this one sorry i'll show you this one so it doesn't require uh, balanced uh, data set okay so uh, this is im pisran and chen ips okay I, I think it was yeah uh, it was 2000 t uh, 2003 the first one yeah yeah they just relaxed and i think one and um, one of these two as well does the require require balance that i think that was mainly that the one that doesn't require uh i think it's only one yeah i think it's this one and it's one of the advantage of using the ips test yes but I think we had balanced panel data, so it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a concern for us because we had a uh, balanced uh, panel data. And I think that's why we, could, we were able to do all of them. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, probably you will be forced to do this one. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there are other tests that would, um, 
would be uh, applicable in, 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 in cases where we have unbalanced bed later. But this one, yes, for sure it does. It is, yeah. But again, as I said, in this paper, we didn't have, wor we, we were not worried really much about this because we had balanced uh, panel data. Okay, so now what is the conclusion from this? Do we have uh, uh, stationary uh, variables or do we have non-stationary variables? That's what we assumed, by the way. But to be honest, uh, if you look at this carefully, for example, here you've got this with industrial value. These are the assumptions, like you have hom uh, uh, like homogeneous panels, heterogeneous panels, if you have serial uh, uh, dependence or cross-section uh, dependence. So these are different assumptions about the test. But in general, it's just the same unit root test, yeah? And this column with, with intercept, this column with intercept and, and time trend, okay? So basically, if you reject, so these stars mean that you reject the null hypothesis. So yes, even with cases where we reject the null hypothesis, what does it say? Let's look at the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis say all time series in the panel are stationary process. So if you reject that, doesn't mean that they, are, they all are not stationary. So because if you have only one or two stationary, you would, uh, uh, sorry, it doesn't mean that they are non-stationary. So if you have one or two non-stationary, so you reject it anyway. And that's the problem. And that's why you had to do more than one test, hoping that this would be enough evidence that they are not stationary. And that's what we did. Okay? So, <coughs> okay. So now if we have I1, data, then we could, well, let's go and see if there's long-run relationship or if there's uh, contiguration or not, okay? So basically, as I said, testing contiguration in, in banners is like the same as unit root. It's, it's probably more uh, complex because um, you need to consider the possibility of contiguration across groups of variables, okay, as well as within uh, groups. So the early attempt actually to to do this was with Bedroni 1999 and many tests after that were actually all based on the sort of Engel Granger type of test that we did before in time series what we did do you remember we estimate the the equation we get the residual and then we test the residual using ADF or in unit root test and that's the the sort of but in general, what we have, we have two approaches to do the panel contiguration tests. One, which we call the residual base test, which is very similar to what I just explained now. So you run the regression, you obtain the residual, and then use a unit root test to, to examine whether these are whether the residuals are stationary or not. And this is the sort of test, Bedroni uh, 1999 and 2004, and this is what we applied in the paper. Okay, we've done both, by the way, sorry. So or you can construct an error correction model and then you test for the significance of the error correction term. And this is the Westerland 2007. In the paper, we did both and I will explain why we did both. So again, before we just get lost in this, we test for panel uh, unit root. It seems that we have I1 data, okay, or I1 variables. That's why now the next step is to test for contiguration. Why are we doing this? Because we want to estimate that equation of the energy consumption. Okay? Why? Because we want to obtain the residuals. Okay? So you need to have a, 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 a good model, okay? A, a correct or correctly specified model, and then you need to really to use like a proper estimation uh, method, method to get the residual or a good estimator or a good proxy of the unexplained part of the economic activity so you have to be very you have to be uh, very um, not very sure but you have to worry much about what method to use and that's why we we, we had to go for this sort of methodology so again we used for uh, we, we test for panel unit root it seems i1 and then we go for uh, panel contiguration we say there are two different tests bedroni which is the um, residual base test so when we say residual base test it's very straightforward. Estimate the model, get the residual, examine the residual. That's it. Okay? Westerland is like air correction based model. So you have an air correction model and then you, uh, uh, you, you test whether the 
uh, error term is significant or not, statistically significant or not. So it's very straightforward. It's the same way we did it uh, before with time series, but this this uh, time for um, for panel data. So again, so with the residual based test like Bedroni test for contagration, it's, uh, uh, it's with the flavor of the traditional Engel Granger contagration test in time series setting, and this is what we did when we did time series econometrics. So if the residuals are found to be stationary, that means uh, there, there's long-run equilibrium exists or long-run relationship exists between the variables or they are co-integrated, okay? Uh, but the problem here, or the contagration vector may be different for each country because we have nine countries and the deterministic components are allowed to be uh, country-specific. Okay, so that's why this test is designed for heterogeneous bandwidth because you could allow for different uh, or the contagrating vectors to be different in, in uh, for each country and also the same for deterministic components. So this is the main equation for the test. So again, what we need to do here, so just basically, if you look at the, so these are the two variables. We can have more than two variables, but let's say this is y and x. And what we have here, we have the parameters alpha i and delta i here. That means we allow for the possibility of having country-specific uh, uh, deterministic components like fixed effect and trend effect, okay? Because you've got this subscript i. So that means it could be different for different, uh, different countries, okay? So what we need from this equation? It's residual based test, yeah? Estimate the equation, then you obtain the residuals. Once you obtain the residuals, all what we need to do is just to examine these residuals using one of the uh, unit root tests, okay? And that's basically what, what it does. So what Bedroni does, so basically for this equation, for this error, oops, sorry. Yeah. So for this, uh, it, it, uh, it actually give seven residual based tests under the null hypothesis is. So every time when you do a test, you need to think of what is the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is no contagration. So the null hypothesis, no contribution. So the difference for these uh, uh, different uh, test statistics, if I can say, uh, four of them are based on pooling this equation. So the question is, remember, we said estimate this, get the residual. How to estimate this? That's a question, yeah? How to estimate this, yeah? This is what we covered last uh, week. You could pool them, and if you do that, Okay, so the first four, uh, uh, in, in so we got seven test statistics for Bedroni test. So four of them are based on pooling these, this equation, and then it get the residual from there, okay? So the null hypothesis, we said no contagration. So if you reject the null hypothesis, that means we have contagration, okay? So what about the other uh, three? So four are based on pooling the data, and the other three are based on the uh, the between group estimation, okay? So if you just uh, don't remember what these are, just go back to the lecture from last last week. Anyway, so wherever the, the they are calculated, these are these statistics. It's important to know what is the null hypothesis, no co-integration. How is like the mechanics of the the mechanism? of the oh, the mechanic of the, how, how does it work? The test, uh, submit the equation, obtain the residual, examine the residual. That's that's how it works, yeah? So the different different test statistic is about how you estimated this equation and how you get these uh, these residuals. So anyway, so but in all cases, you just examine the residual, whether they are in t uh, I1 or I0. If they are I1, then there's a problem. If I0, then that means we are, we uh, we have configuration. So this is the this is table three in the paper. So as I said, we've got how many seven? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, it's just within and between. It's just the way we uh, we um, we obtain the um, we estimate the first equation and then we obtain the residuals. So as I said, if you if you if you reject the null, that is uh, evidence of integration because the null hypothesis says there's no integration. Okay? Yeah, I think I. So no co-integration. So that's the null hypothesis of a reject, which is the case here, most of these test statistics. That means we, we have evidence of co-integration. Okay, so what are the variables that, 
uh, arc integrated here. Do you remember them? We've got three variables in the whole. Do you remember them? So we have energy consumption, energy price, and <laughs> industrial to industrial value added to GDP ratio. Okay. So just remember what we're doing. Just don't get lost in details because so many details here. Eh? Um, the problem here with this estimation, why would why did we need to do another test for integration? So the problem here is that this Bedroni test failed to reject the null hypothesis, even in cases where integration is strongly suggested by economic theory. So again, there's some sort of evidence that there are issues with, we didn't fail to reject, we reject anyway, but which means that we don't have to worry about this problem. But again, as a, as a, uh, uh, like a more robust uh, or, or confirmed decision, we, we, we decided to go for another test as well, which is the uh, Westerland uh, test for uh, panel configuration. It's a very simple test. As I said, it's based on error correction model. And if you should be familiar with this structure now, this is an error correction uh, model. And as I said, all what you need to do is to test for the significance of this uh, parameter here. So if this is significant, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of idea. So you need to, to estimate this error correction model. And to the null hypothesis, again, is the same. No integration, okay? Because if this equals zero, then they are not integrated. Y and X are not integrated, okay? So basically, you just construct this air uh, correction model. You estimate the model, and you test for the um, significance of this parameter. If it's equal zero, then we have no integration. If not, if then... So if you reject this, that means there's evidence of integration. Okay. Um, so th there are a number of, again, test statistics. Like the, the it's the same way with, with Bedroni, where he gave us seven test statistics. Okay. So we've got four here. Two test statistics are... Uh, two tests are designed to test the alternative hypothesis that the panel is integrated as a whole. And the other two uh, say the alternative is that at least one uh, unit uh, is integrated. So they are just different with the alternative hypothesis. Okay. So um, these are just empirical evidence how, um, how this one is different from Bedroni. And that's why these are reasons why we, 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 we did another test for integration. But again, it just, uh, it just we wanted to confirm the idea of that we've got integrated variables. So we use Westerland test. And as I said, it was uh, found to be uh, of higher power than Bedroni. And it allows for completely heterogeneous uh, specification of both long run and short run because we have error correction model rather than the, uh, uh, the other model with Bedroni. Um, and and etc. So different different reason why we use the this test. So what we have here again, we said we have four test statistic. Again, this is table uh, number four in the paper. And what we have here is the this is the test statistic and this is the p value. So we've got if you got small b value, that means you reject the null hypothesis. So rejecting the null hypothesis, what was the null the null hypothesis? No integration. So if you reject, that means there is integration. Okay. So now we feel more comfortable to go for uh, 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 this sort of technique then, because we, we now we know we've got I one data, we got integrated panels, and then we could we could have a, a dynamic panel data model, and we can use one of the uh, panel integration uh, techniques. Okay. So that is the idea here. So the panel integration test reported this, uh, reported now uh, in the previous slide and in the paper, uh, suggests the presence of integrating relations among the variables. And to estimate the model, okay, to estimate the model, we used, as I said, we used then the group uh, mean fully modified or less, uh, which, uh, by the way, pr uh, proposed by Bedroni 2001, and it is, is actually designed for co integrated panels. So you need first to, con to confirm that there's integration, okay? That's why we did the panel unit root test, and we did four tests. Why did we do four tests? Because they are of low power, all of them. So we wanted different ways. By, and by the way, even I did the uh, individual series as well, just to be comfortable to, to assume that these are I1 uh, variables, okay? 
So it seems there's evidence we've got I1 variables, and then we move to configuration, whether we have configurated variables or not. We found that we've got configurated uh, variables, and then we use the this estimation or this uh, MGFMOLS again. It's main group fully modified OLS, ordinary least square estimator. I'm not going to explain the structure of the how this is basically uh, uh, worked, but I think you can go back to the paper or if you want to check how it works. Okay. And this is the estimation. It's not very clear, but what we have here is again. So this is the uh, the, the the coefficient. So the estimation with no trend and with trend, but uh, adding trend. So what we have here, remember the variables on the left and the right hand side. So on the left hand side, the dependent variable was the uh, energy consumption. On the right hand side, we have the energy price and industrial value added to GDP. So we would expect that the price to be negative. Okay, so when the when energy become more costly or the prices go up, then we would expect that's that's what economic theory tells us. So we should consume less. Okay, um, and that's why. So it is negative and significant, and industrial value added. So again, this is uh, related to development. How how the economy is growing. So as the economy gro grows, then we would expect positive impact. So we would expect to consume more energy. So again, it's positive and and significant in, in both cases. So what that means, what does that mean? That now we, we successfully filter the e energy consumption data. Okay, so what is left? So meaning filtering it, but so now we know the impact of, or the effects of these two factors, of the, these two regressors, X, uh, energy price and, and, and industrial value added to GDP, then what is left in the residuals is what is not explained by this by this model and that's what we assume this is the 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 shadow economy but what we wanted here because we had the growth so that means the residual in this case would represent the growth in the shadow economy so it's not the size of the shadow economy is the growth in the shadow economy so how it grow uh, over time so if you look at the residuals from this equation that's what exactly what we did so we obtain the residual from this uh, this equation and then we follow the uh, procedure that is described in the paper to test for do you remember the, ma the main question the, the main research question how the shadow economy or the size of the shadow economy behave over the um, crisis or in time of financial crisis okay whether it increase or decrease. So what we did, we got nine nine countries. We got the estimation for uh, about 40 years for for the for the size of the uh, shared economy in each one of those countries. And then what we did is basically uh, we run uh, uh, individual um, var specific country specific vars. So we moved from. So now we estimated the uh, uh, the the size of the shared economy using panel configuration using this 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 equ from this equation this is from the equation and then when we move to answer the question so now all of this to just to measure the side of the size of the shared economy and then to answer the question how this affect how how the um, how this respond to financial crisis then we use country specific uh, country specific var models we cover var models before okay so one of the um, and these are the, the the responses so what we have here these are the impulse response function uh, for each one of those countries. So we've got Argentina, Ecuador, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Brazil, China. I think that was Mexico um, and Turkey. Okay. So the idea here is that now it seems there's positive impact. And this doesn't last forever. So it's just temporary. So whenever there's a, a financial shock or a financial crisis, then that means the shadow economy expands so having the shared economy expands that means it helps in absorbing the shock because those who uh, lost their jobs in the official uh, or in the formal sector they move to uh, be employed or to find jobs in the informal sectors and the main policy conclusion here was that it could be one way to do uh, to absorb or to help the economy recover from the shock is to uh, from a financial shock is to relax the anti shadow policies in time of financial crisis it's something that wouldn't be expected. Most people wouldn't agree with, but that's what we saw. If 
if that is the case, if the shared economy would have the economy to absorb the shock, then why not? Okay? Okay. So one of the uh, uh, issues with this estimation, uh, one of the uh, points that the reviewers um, raised is that why didn't we use panel VAR rather than having individual VAR models? Okay, why didn't we use a panel VAR? So we thought we've got the estimation that we're happy with, we're convinced really with what we see, but we also we can make sure we can double check by using a panel VAR model. Panel VAR model uses the structure of the uh, so if basically you have um, lag dependent variable in the right hand side as well, so you've got the dynamic panel as well. So basically, this is what we did, and you can you can use GMM in this case. And what we did is again, we you can produce the the impulse response function. And this is what we did. So this is this is from a panel var estimation, not individual var. And again, it shows very similar, very similar to what we've uh, found using individual var uh, uh, models. Again, the question was how the shadow economy behave during the um, financial crisis. Okay, our main, our uh, the 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 only point that or the main point that's related to the topic today is how would we estimate the size of the shared economy using panel configuration technique. That was the example we used. We used four tests for unit truth test. We, we show that it's I1 and then the, the, the variables we have are I1 and then we move to test for integration using two different tests, Bidroni and, and Westerland. And then both show us that there is integration. We reject another hypothesis of no integration in, in both cases. So we've got evidence of uh, uh, integrated panels and that's why we move to the MG uh, the mean group fully modified or less ordinary least square and and we estimate that to get the size of the uh, to get the residuals we use the residual to generate the data for the shared economy the size of the shared economy and from there we used country specific var models and then the reviewers suggest that we should use panel as well we did panel i had some um i wasn't sure really about the panel but anyway because that was was one of the questions that uh, were, uh, uh, was raised by the reviewers, then we did, we, 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 we thought that we could confirm this by using panel VAR as well. But it, it was on the main estimation we had in the, in, in the paper, with just a very small section about the robustness check. Okay? So basically, so what, uh, what is the takeaway message today? Okay, let's start from the beginning. So most panels, or most panel techniques or traditional panel techniques were designed for the case when we have big N, yeah, and small t. And that's what we call micro uh, econometrics. It was basically based on survey data where you have, as you said in your case, 20,000 individuals and two points, uh, two years or two rounds. So two, uh, uh, t equal two. Okay, so you see how how large n compared to t. Okay, so but recently we have more we have development in in panel uh, time series where we have to deal with uh, large t. So when you have large t or large panel in general, then you need to think of both issues related to cross sections and time series. So there are three issues we explained that we need to keep in mind or need to worry about if we have a, a large panel heterogeneity, dynamics, which we dealt with today, and uh, cross-section dependence, okay? So we focus today, through this example, we use this paper, we focused on one, uh, on how to estimate the size of the shared economy, okay? It's just an example. What we did, we first start with the panel unit root tests. We used four tests. We say that we explain the differences between these tests. So the first three, they test for the uh, the null hypothesis unit uh, uri unit root. The uh, Hadri test for the stationary stationary data. Okay, and uh, just these are just very small differences between these these tests. And again, why do we need to do more than uh, uh, one unit root test? Again, because all these tests are really of low power and I is not very powerful tests. And even with time series econometrics, by the way, even when you do when you read a paper that uses time series data they are likely to, to use different uh, uh, unit root tests as well, okay? Just to uh, try to confirm their, their conclusion. 
or what they conclude about the properties of the, the data they have. Then once we, we had uh, sort of evidence that we've got uh, 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 I1 variables, then we move to test for contagration, whether there's long run relationship or, or not between these variables. Okay, then we use two tests. Again, residual based test, that's the drone test, where you estimate the model, you examine the residuals. Westerland test is based on error correction model. You submit an error correction model and then you test whether the significance of the this the error term coefficient, whether it is significant or not. Okay? So again, the null hypothesis in both tests is no contigration. So if you reject the null hypothesis, we've got evidence of contigration. And that's what we have, and that's what we've shown in the tables, yeah? And then finally we could use one of the uh, estimators that are actually designed for uh, contigrated panels and one examples we, we just covered is the uh, mean group fully modified ordinary least squares okay and that's what we what we use okay any questions